Thank you so much for coming. I know that it's a terrible traffic morning, and we expect that people will continue to trickle in as they stagger out of the metro or out of Uber, which is apparently charging triple um, rate this morning, taking advantage of the uh, traffic problems in DC. We were just chatting about that in the corridor. Um, I'm Liza Mundy. I'm a DC area journalist and director of the Breadwinning and Caregiving Program here at New America, which is a fancy term for our work family program. Um, we are dedicated to the reality that men and women alike are breadwinners and caregivers these days, and we need to um, innovate and update our workplace and government policies to recognize that and to make it more possible for men and women to fulfill these obligations. So we're very interested in work-life balance, but we're also very interested in inclusion and um, gender in inclusion in, uh, in all, all sec sectors of the, of the labor market, and obviously we'll be talking about the tech sector today. Um, and New America, for those of you, in case you haven't been here, we're um, about a decade old. Uh, we're a think tank dedicated to new ideas and uh, uh, creating a safe place for the radical center um, to coming up with ideas that are, are not, not, that are independent minded and nonpartisan. So we're very happy to have you here this morning. Uh, we're very happy to have Vivek Wadwa here to talk about uh, the book of essays that he um, has uh, put together and contributed to uh, called Innovating Women, uh, looking at the, um, the situation for women in the American tech sector. And this is, a, uh, this is an area I think that we're hoping to do more and more work in because um, women have made inroads into a lot of fields that they were shut out of for a long time. Medicine these days has been pretty hospitable to women doctors. There are fields of medicine like pediatrics and OBGYN, um, but not just those fields, also fields like dermatology and some surgical fields that are dominated by women now. Uh, psychology, accounting, veterinary medicine, um, the, these are fields that have flipped from being majority male to being majority female. So women are doing well in some, um, some of our white collar professions, but the tech sector is, has been a really hard nut for women to crack. And um, I was thinking, uh, some research I was doing recently about the, the US Senate, uh, I was astonished to, uh, to learn that as early as the 1990s in the US Senate, there had only ever been one or two female senators at any given time. So back, those of you who remember the Anita Hill hearings or who've even heard of the Anita Hill hearings, um, e even at that point, there had only been one or two women in the US Senate. It's a little better in the Senate today. We've got 20 women senators, so we're at one fifth. But the tech sector is kind of like the US Senate in the 1950s. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, it's really extraordinary. So, um, so Vivek is going to talk about why that is and what we can do about it. Just as a little bit of an introduction, he has affiliations at any number of distinguished universities. Um, you're affiliated with Duke University here on the East Coast, but you live in Silicon Valley and you're affiliated with Stanford and also with Singularity University. Um, and uh, so. And, and I think for people in the DC area may also know you from your, your writing on leadership for the Washington Post. Um, so uh, you had, it sounds like, kind of an epiphany moment when you realized, even though you lived in Silicon Valley, it sort of took an epiphany for you to realize how absent women are. And I wonder if you could just talk about that moment. Yeah, we moved to Silicon Valley about four, four and a half years ago. My wife said she wanted to be there, so we moved to Silicon Valley. And um, I had been researching entrepreneurship. I had been researching US immigration policy. And um, I was in love with Silicon Valley. I mean, I called it the perfect meritocracy. I wrote about how amazing it was, how welcoming it was to immigrants, because I had documented that 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley were founded by immigrants. And they were immigrants from all over the world. It wasn't one country. It was practically every country you can name had founders who were creating Silicon Valley companies. So I thought it was a model of what um, any industry should be, diverse it as pos pos could possibly be. And I'd also been researching entrepreneurship. I had documented what makes an entrepreneur, what makes them different. I've been working very closely with Kaufman Foundation. And a lot of their, um, uh, their work on entrepreneurship over the last few years was with, you know, in collaboration with my teams. And um, I, you know, I said if we went to Silicon Valley, I also, 
as a hobby do writing. So I used to write for Business Week. And then when I went there, I got invited by the local tech blog, TechCrunch, to write for them. TechCrunch is like the Washington Post of Silicon Valley. <laughs> And um, I was at a TechCrunch, a uh, big TechCrunch event. This is literally about four or five months after landing in Silicon Valley. And um, we're sitting there. I mean, we we were ha happened to be seated in the, the front area. And Mark Zuckerberg was sitting next to us. And it was amazing, you know, this little kid wearing a hoodie. And then you look at him, he's the Mark Zuckerberg you read about. So I was sort of, you know, it was like, you know, ooh, ah, wow. Look at who we're sitting next to. So my wife in the middle of the, of the, of the uh, event says, Vivek, do you notice something strange over here? I said, yeah, we're sitting next to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I said, did you, did you, didn't you recognize him? She says, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, look around. Well, well, what don't you see? And I, I know my first impression was, well, they're mostly young kids. So I, but I didn't say that. And I, I you know, played dumb. I mean, I, in fact, I was dumb. And she says, where are the women? She got really angry at me. Says, where are the women? And it was like the Twilight Zone. Have you, have you folks watched the Twilight Zone? <laughs> it's like Heard of the Twilight Zone. Getting into an alien world and suddenly you see something is wrong. Imagine going to a city and everything looks normal to you until you notice there are no children. Right. Or there are no, in this case, there are no women. In the audience, it was almost all male. On, we started watching very closely what was happening on stage. There were two women uh, that whole evening on stage. One was uh, uh, staff. The other was a circus performer. No women on stage. And it was like, uh, I mean, uh, after she said that, that whole evening it started bothering me. Where are the women? Where are the women? What's going on over here? Because I was writing for TechCrunch. I wasn't taking any money from them. I was just writing for them because uh, it, it was my way of giving back to Silicon Valley. And it was a cool uh, tech blog. So I could write stupid things in, in, in the tech blog that I couldn't get away with in academic publications or in Business Week. So I was writing provocative articles for them. And it was a weird experience. Where are the women? And then I went back home. I, I didn't sleep much last night because I started thinking, you know, flashback to my own research. I had been researching Silicon Valley. And I realized that um, in all the entrepreneurship research I had done for Kaufman Foundation, in which we had surveyed and interviewed literally thousands of people over the years, I didn't even have a field recording the gender of the person we interviewed. I didn't think gender was, was relevant or important or a factor in entrepreneurship until I realized that one of the genders is missing from the tech industry that I've been writing so much about. And the next few weeks, it was like, um, um, it was a, a wake up call. I started then researching the uh, companies. I started going, doing simple things like going to the websites of all the top companies, Microsoft. Uh, Apple, Google, you go to Microsoft site, for example, there was not one woman anywhere in the executive team, in the management team. And I don't think there was anyone, uh, there was a woman on the board as well. We started looking through the websites, looking for chief technology officers, all male. There were a few exceptions. Um, Marissa Meyer was a senior exec at Google. You had Padmashri Warrior at Cisco. But I could name all the, <laughs> all the women uh, in, in tech. And, uh, and they would fit on <laughs> the fingers of your hand. I mean, it was that ridiculous. And then I went back and started looking at my own academic research. And it was driving me crazy that I didn't have, yeah, you know, you've had this feeling sometimes, how could I be so dumb? The, the, the Sherlock Holmes, oh, what a fool I've been. Yeah, exactly. So then I literally, I spent tens of hours going through my own research and, and re-engineering it, basically. Because you can figure out the difference between a man and a woman most of the time by looking at the name. If it's Joe or John, the likelihood is it's a man, right? And same thing with Indian names. There were a lot of Indian names in it and Chinese names. I, I could do that. So about the 20, 25% that weren't black and white, I started making phone calls. I started looking up the companies, going to websites, Googling, started reverse engineering, all of those um, things. So I went through a sample of five. Uh, my last research was 500 um, people we had interviewed. I literally went through, uh, through every one of them and re-engineered to figure out what this thing and I was surprised that 8% of our sample was women, which, which was high, actually, compared to what I learned later on. 8%, 8% was, was women. Um, and this is the perfect meritocracy. And, and, the, and this research was entrepreneurship in the tech sector. In the tech sector, okay. exactly. This is specifically the tech sector. And then I started, and this was all across the United States. 
So it wasn't just Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley was actually, when I looked at it further, the data set became so small that there were hardly any test Silicon Valley. This was more outside Silicon Valley than anywhere else. And then I started looking at other research and asked, calling up my friends, uh, my you know, professor friends, asking them for research. And uh, then I, again, I had carte blanche publishing right on TechCrunch. So I wrote a piece for TechCrunch saying, Silicon Valley, you and your venture capitalists have a gender problem. Uh, so this event was in December. That blog was in February. That's how, you know, how much time it took me to read this research. And I was even more shocked at what happened after that, that piece. Talk about that, please. Oh, my God. Welcome um, to the world of writing about gender. Um, oh, my God. I mean, uh, when I write about immigration, even today, I get slanderous comments. I get, I've received death threats for, for talking about how important immigration is to America's mm -hmm. prosperity and to be highlighting the fact that the majority of uh, startups in Silicon Valley are founded by immigrants. I was used to that. I would, you, know, you, you basically, you know, if, if you're able to read any of my Washington Post columns on immigration, or even when I talk about uh, foreigners in any way, you'll find that they get saturated with negative, nasty comments. These people come out in droves and they attack you. Fine. You get used to it. And it used to bother me at first. Now sort of I just laugh. Yeah. It's, the same, it's the same cut and paste you see over and over and over again. On women, I had no idea what was going to happen. That suddenly, the, uh, the comment section lit up like you won't believe. Hundreds of comments, nasty, nasty, nasty comments. Emails coming to me. Social media attacks. Friends writing to me, warning me not to discuss this topic. Because I, 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 you know, I used to be a tech, before becoming an academic, I had founded two technology companies. I used to be a CEO. And I knew a who's who of the uh, technology industry. And I knew the leading venture capitalists. So I, I was con connected to the top echelons of Silicon Valley. Some of my, my f friends, I mean, I, I don't call them friends anymore, they're writing to me saying, Vivek, there are easier ways of getting laid. Come with us and we'll help you out. I mean, comments like that from, these are people you read about. You know, when you, you know, go through the Silicon Valley list of, of industry moguls, some of these people are on, are on those big, amazing lists. And then uh, others advising, saying, Vivek, you're new to Silicon Valley. Um, and this is not something you want to be delving into. And I'm sort of sitting there saying, what happened? Wait, what's going on here? And I went home and I showed my wife some of these comments. And she too was shocked. And she, the first reaction was, oh my god, well, we've just moved over here. We don't want to uh, get kicked out of Silicon <laughs> Valley. <laughs> so that was my, uh, you know, my waking up. Uh, that was my ex experience. It was just a wake up call for me. How do you account for the level of hostility that you encountered in raising the issue? Because it's pretty um, self-evident, right? It's not like you were exposing something that... Neither that it's not self-evident. I mean, the fact that I didn't know it. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not a sexist. I was also wasn't a feminist. Now people call me a feminist. And I've come to the point that I'm saying I'm proud of being a feminist. Call me a feminist. Thank you. Make my day. There's nothing wrong with being a feminist. Everyone, um, guys feel proud of being called macho. Okay, if, but women feel ashamed of being called feminists. So now my attitude is, make my day, call me a feminist. Uh, but the point is that I, wasn't, I was never a sexist either. Right? I was just an average guy. And I didn't know there was a problem. I didn't, I, uh, being an academic, I should have had the responsibility of recording gender and, and noting it. And so I, I didn't. So if I, if I was that dumb, how can I blame? Uh, now, the people who have uh, you know, been attacking me, okay, absolutely blame them. They're a bunch of sexist jerks. I mean, uh, I'll take them on any day, but the vast majority are, are like me. So again, how do you account then for the, when, when you say, okay, it's not self-evident, but it is true that any of us could go on the websites. It's, it's like not, you can't argue with the numbers that you see on the website or the absence of women. So it's not, it's not open to debate. That Lisa, I, I, would not, I would not read those articles which, featured, which were about women or women's inclusion. I, it didn't seem, you know, you, when you uh, go and look, look at articles online, there's certain articles which are of interest to you, read them, other articles you don't read. So there, it was not, never an area of interest to me before because it didn't seem relevant. I mean, I didn't see what the big deal was about until I stepped into the debate. Right. And, and again, I'm sorry, the, the question is, why do you think you got such a, for example, the emails that you could have gotten, People could have said, oh, yes, we know this is a problem. We see and we're, we're doing our best, you know, we're, we're, but that's not what you got. No, you got hostility they, and, they, because and. Because they, um, because the attitude is that women are feminists, burn your bras, you know, all of this anti feminism uh, stuff. The attitude is that uh, women are just complaining about nothing. How dare they? 
how, how dare they ask for their rights? How dare they ask for their human rights? I mean, it's that sort of attitude, and we're better than them. And then in the uh, junior sectors of the tech industry, you've got these nerds who think that they have better coding powers than women do. So it's a systematic problem with maybe 10 to 20 percent of the, um, of the you know, uh, of Silicon Valley. So I'm not talking about the majority. I'm talking about uh, a, a small but significant part of it. And you've got these sexist jerks everywhere. So that they end, to end up being in the venture capital firms because they come from New York City, fresh out of investment banking to New York City. They, they get greedier and now want to uh, exploit the, 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 the you know, Silicon Valley tech industry, so they move over there. And then the VC firms, the way it works in VC firms is that uh, everyone votes. And if there's one down vote, the person doesn't get funding. And if you have women going in front of the VCs, one of, one of, the, one of the jerks in the meeting will ask her about what, do you, what does your husband think? Has he given you permission to be here? To be here? What happens when you have children? I mean, it, all these are the type of questions women are asked all the time. But your question about uh, uh, why and how, it's, they must have been abused as children or something. I don't know what their problem is, or why they're so unsure of themselves. But it could just be an inferiority complex, that uh, they've come across women who are smarter than they are. Uh, and their only way of, of uh, uh, you know, accounting for it was that we're superior to women. I, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, like I said, this is not my upbringing, and this is uh, not something that I even thought about until I stepped into this debate. And now I battle these people all the time. Read any of my articles. Read, go to the comment sections, and you'll see all the negative, nasty hatred, the, the venom that I have to uh, bear with, you know, uh, whenever I step into this thing. And also, uh, and this is, and they no, no longer do that. But when I, and I, and I actually quoted some of the tweets in this without, without naming the, uh, the people. If you look at the people who were attacking me, you know, so soon afterwards, there was a chorus of, of, of uh, cele celebrities from Silicon Valley telling Mike Arrington, who was the head of TechCrunch, to fire me from TechCrunch. Never mind that TechCrunch didn't pay me anything. I was just doing this as, you know, as a hobby. They wanted me fired from TechCrunch. One very established, very senior investor, this guy is considered to be a legend in Silicon Valley, called me a fraud, academic fraud. All of his, he basically challenged my academic credentials publicly. And he, he did that several times afterwards because of what I've written about women. This is Silicon Valley. And yet, this is one of the most desirable sectors of our economy, right? This is this one is of the most glamorous and desirable absolutely. places to work. And one of, the, um, one of the, the sort of phenomena that I worry about, I was sitting around with a, a group actually of women from finance, and we were talking about the areas where women have been able to emerge as leaders. And one of the areas is, uh, happens to be university presidents. And specifically, there was a period not that long ago in the Ivy League where half of Ivy League presidents were female, yeah. actually. Yeah. And, and, but the joke that one of the women made was, yes, back when being a university president was a great job, was a really cushy job, and you got just to sort of hang out in this really nice house, you know, that, then it was a male domain. But, but now that it's a really hard, grinding job that requires constant fundraising, you know, they're going to hand it over to the women. And similarly, I mean, even in politics, as women are making progress, politics is becoming a harder, um, you know, less respected job by the minute. And so here we have the tech sector, you know, which gets all this glorious press, all this glamour, great products. Um, I mean, talk about Apple. T talk about, uh, let, just talk, to talk about some numbers. You have a sentence in your book that, that top S management, S there are no women. Yeah. S uh, Steve Jobs was, was one of the biggest sexists in Silicon Valley. I mean, that, that's a fact. Steve Jobs had, was arrogant. He mistreated his employees. There was a dark side to Steve Jobs we don't talk about because we glamorize him. We love his products. But the reality is that he wasn't such a wonderful human being when it came to uh, treating, about, uh, you know, treating other people. That's the reality of it. So Silicon Valley, despite the fact we glamorize it, has a dark side. That's just the way it is. And this is the dark side that I've been battling. I made myself very unpopular with some of Silicon Valley's most uh, established uh, players. My attitude is, that's great. I mean, I love yeah, it. How is your social life in Silicon Valley? But actually, now? you know, the amazing thing is I get treated like a rock star now when I go to conferences. Because um, women, I mean, I mean, they have been thanking me for this. Uh, there, there is, okay, even in women, there's probably yeah. a two or three percent uh, community which, which has been attacking me mindlessly. I mean, that's a separate discussion. But probably 95 percent of women have been strongly supportive mm -hmm. of it. And uh, probably about 70, 80 percent of men have been strongly supportive about it. So the people I care about have been supporting me, yeah. and I get treated with a lot of respect. And um, it's amazing how much support I've received. Even for this book, um, 
you know, um, I, I, want, I want, can I talk to Dieter talk and talk about, about it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started on this path of writing about women. And uh, um, so after that article, um, I, I decided to write more about it. Uh, that's the way I am, that you, you know, take me on, provoke me, and you, you know, my address make my day. So I wrote several more articles about it. And to the point that Arrington also was getting pissed off. But they were, within Tech Point, they were really, really angry at me because they were getting battered by, by their supporters and people, uh, you know, the community they're in for Vivek Wadwa being, you know, um, you know a, a, a mad dog, whatever. I mean, you know, they called me everything under the sun. And they were very resentful of me, but I kept writing about it um, because I believed in the cause. And then I started doing more research on it. And um, now, with three years later, uh, four years later, I decided that um, I, I'm going to publish a paper on this. I want to express opinion. And in academia, you can't express opinion in papers. If you read any, read any academic paper, dull and boring. And you know, they have to sort of hedge their opinion by contradicting everything they've said. So they'll, they'll take a stand one second, and then they'll cite everyone else that disagrees with them. That's the way academic papers are, dull and boring. So I wanted to express a strong opinion over here. So I thought I'd write a book about it. The problem is, who's a guy to write about women? I mean, I might as, might as well be writing about uh, <laughs> I mean, any other problem that women have. I mean, uh, so, so that was a dilemma I had. Uh, and then also, um, I had spent a lot of my own money on research, and I, I wanted to get permission to spend another thirty or $40,000 on uh, this thing. I have to go to the boss whenever I have to make any major spending decisions. Who's your I, boss? Your my boss? wife. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know who the, okay. I know who the boss is. Okay. So I, basically, I went to her and I said, Tavinder, uh, um, I'm thinking of writing a book about this. And I also want to spend, you know, and I said, probably thirty forty thousand $40,000. And she very thoughtfully she says, Vivek, uh, fine, I mean, you can spend whatever you want to spend. Uh, but um, if women really care about this cause, if they really appreciate what you're doing for them, why don't you get them to help you? Because I also told her that you know, it's going to be tricky for a guy to write a book about women and their problems. So the light went off in my head, saying that, look, I talk about advancing technologies. I talk about how technology is changing the world and going to help us solve big problems and so on. And one of the things I, I talk about in my lectures on advancing technologies is crowdfunding, crowd creating. The fact that now we have the ability to, to gather the, uh, uh, I mean, to get thousands of people, millions of people to work with us on the causes we believe in. The light went off saying, hey, why don't I crowdfund this? Why don't I do what I coach startups to do, is to s forget the venture capitalists, go and uh, do a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign and let the crowd fund it. So I started thinking about it. I said, you know, that could be a cool idea. I don't know if anyone's ever crowdfunded a book before. I don't know if someone has, anyone's ever crowd created a book before. But let's crowd create it. My goal was to raise initially $25,000. And then I said $40,000. Because I, you know, I decided that all the money from this, every penny we raise from the book is going to go to a fund for women, to educate them, to inspire them, to fund them, and so on. So I said, I'm not going to take any money from this. So uh, why don't we just raise more money than we need? So instead of $25,000, $30,000, let's take $40,000. And my ambition was to have 30 women working with me on this book. And I was nervous would 30 women work with me. I was shocked that we uh, ended up getting $96,000, including some uh, a grant from Google for the, for the book. So 40 became 96. And instead of 30 or 40, we had more than 500 women sign up to crowd create the book from us for us. Out of the 500 who signed up, um, 200 were, were uh, you know, were, were, were listeners and watching, and but 300 were actively, actively uh, uh, working on this. So that we, we uh, so I engaged Farai Chadia. Farai is an amazing um, uh, woman. She's based in New York City. She's African American journalist. She's been, she's got her own, uh, you know, radio show and so on. She's, uh, she'd be an NPR. So um, I sent a ma message to my mailing list asking for volunteers, and she's on my mailing list. And she wrote back saying, Vivek, I want to work with you on this project. So she agreed to be my co-author. And we got together and we laid out the structure of the book, what we wanted to say in the book, all the data we needed, all the research we needed, the anecdotes we needed. And we essentially had a crowd creating platform in which we invited our ambassadors. The ambassadors were the women who agreed to help us with the book and to uh, help us with social media when the book was done. And within six weeks, we did research that would have taken us years to do, because it's painstaking to have to be able to gather opinions and, and, and come to consensus, and then to get anecdotes together. You have to interview people. It's really, uh, you know, uh, you, have you written books before? Yes. Yeah, so you know how yeah. long it takes. It takes years to write books. It does take years. Within six weeks, I had enough material to write several mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. And then Farai, uh, you know, went and distilled it. And then I spent a few weeks more 
polishing it and, and getting it into um, the final format. But we were able to crowd create this book. And I was really nervous. I was afraid that I would get slammed for, um, uh, for a book that didn't hold together or that had too many voices. Quite to the contrary. Every review I've received, every comment. I mean, I, every day I get emails from women from all over the world thanking me for writing it. They're saying it inspired them. They're giving it to their daughters. Um, um, it basically, and, and, and all the ambassadors, they've been raving about it. So every comment that I've read about the book so far has been positive. I mean, no one who's read the book has criticized it, which is amazing. Because I, I, again, crowd creating, you could crowd create garbage. But it doesn't look like if we crowd created garbage. I think we've created, crowd created a, a pretty solid work. So right, I'm, and it doesn't read like a cacophony of voices. I mean, you've yeah. got, you've got disparate people writing essays that hold together as essays. But it, it was a challenge to put everyone's voices in. Yes. Because it wasn't, you know, so I, there are two or three chapters that I've written where I took a stand right. and put my name on it right. because that's strong opinion. Yes. But for the other chapters, it was really, really trying to synthesize the voices of women. Right. It was tricky doing it, taking all the information we had and turning it into something which which was consistent. Right. And some of the chapters are, are essays by women who prevailed and they're inspiring stories and here's how I did it. And some of them, and I have to say these were the ones that were the most interesting to me, are women describing the barriers, uh, women describing sexual harassment, um, really sort of shocking things that happened to them in meetings with high level executives. Or like, like, or he, like Heidi Roizen, who has now become a legendary venture capitalist. She's one of the leading people in Silicon Valley. She basically opened up and, and poured her heart out and talked about how disgusting you know how venture capitalists treated her she's in a meeting uh, pitching a company and you've got this jerk there making symbols with his hand right. coming on to her sexually um, while she's in a meeting there she goes out to dinner with a, with with a, with a client and uh, the uh, i mean this is a, 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 a you know very senior executive he says they've got a gift for you close your eyes and he op unzips his uh, his pants and puts her hand on his penis that's the heidi rosen talking about it Kim Police, who's, who uh, founded Marimba, she was one of the, the most successful entrepreneurs during the dot-com era. Um, she sold her company for half a billion dollars. She gets ripped apart in Forbes for being a failure, an example of, of what not to do. And, and, you know, I mean, and, and when she was successful, basically uh, uh, you know, they made her a glamour girl rather than focusing on her strength. And I thought that was really interesting. I mean, I'd like to go back at some point to the sexual harassment part of it, but the woman that you just talked about who founded Marimba and, and had the problem that um, people kept saying, oh, the focus is on you. You're, uh, you're being glamorized. They're not talking about, or this is what she felt. They weren't talking about her product or her business. They were talking about her. And you do think of the women in the tech industry to whom that happens. Exactly. I mean, Marissa Meyer, I think, would be an example where the focus is just constantly on her as, and, and sometimes on the company and the product. But it really is, a, it's, I hadn't thought about that until I read her essay, that that can be a problem. And, and I guess it's when, when women are, are rare enough that, I don't know, the story sometime, somehow becomes about her as a personality um, as opposed to what she's doing. Kim is extremely competent. She earned her success. Right? The fact that she's good looking, the fact that um, uh, the uh, m uh, you know, publications decided to focus on her sex appeal versus her company isn't her fault. Because I know that she, she was obsessed with trying to, to f talk about her technology and so on. And she felt betrayed a couple of times when the interviews uh, weren't about her technology or her achievements, but they were about her looks how she dressed and, and things like that. So she was very unhappy about it. But the treatment she received afterwards was even more shocking. The, the, you know, the disgusting uh, you know, articles that followed and, and the, her being called a failure. She wasn't a failure. Someone who sells a company for half a billion dollars is not a failure. I mean, I'd, I'd love to be a failure like I, that. So I would take yeah. that. I yeah. would take that failure. Uh, but she opened up and she poured her heart out mm -hmm. for the book as well. So that's the type of support I've had in Silicon Valley. The greatest women over there as well as ordinary women. Uh, you know, I tried very hard not to make this about the Sheryls and the Marissas and uh, you know, the successful women. So, um, it was more about average women because they're the ones whose voices are never heard. So now we have hundreds of women who regard this as their, as their baby. This is, you know, they're so proud. They would never get featured in the press, yet they're featured in a book. And, and, and they're really, this is giving them a lot of encouragement. And they're promoting the heck out of this. And they're doing a wonderful job now getting the word out about, um, uh, uh, you know, about the importance of having more women su be successful. So let's try to break down um, some of the uh, some of the reasons that, or and some of the data that that you and various contributors talk about in the book to try to understand 
what the barriers are to women in this industry. Um, one of the disturbing uh, data points that several essayists mention is the fact that there are fewer female computer scientists now than there were in the 1980s. So this is a field where we've actually seen a decline. Can you talk about why, uh, why you think that's happening? I remember the movie uh, Social Network about Zuckerberg? Uh, go back and think about women you saw in it, how they were dressed. They were all wearing bikinis. The guys were the cool guys. The guys were dominating it. So the stereotypes, the images we have in our heads are of the guys doing all the grunt work and the girls basically being entertainment. So that's the image that exists of Silicon Valley. Uh, if you think about, uh, now, now, now I've got to blame parents as well. When uh, you know, parents don't encourage their children generally to get into engineering, very few parents do. Some of the enlightened ones do encourage them to study math and science and get into the hard, into the hard sciences. Otherwise, they may be encouraged to be doctors, but they won't be encouraged to be engineers. So it starts off with childhood, with women getting less encouragement to get into STEM and, and hardcore engineering. And then the women who do get the encouragement from, the, from their parents typically, when they go to college, when they go to school, when you know, high school, my, my university, et cetera, they're treated differently than the guys are. They, even the professors don't treat them. There's examples in there of professors basically mistreating the girls, basically holding them to a different standard and not providing them encouragement. And then they defy the odds and get their degrees, and then they join the workplace, all male. And uh, their bosses don't treat them respectfully. They're raped, they're groped. I mean, it's a sort of horrible uh, experience that women have in, in the workplace, sexually harassed, and they get discouraged. There are very few make it to management. So they end up dropping out of the field. So um, there are very few role models. So all through, th through the entire system, women are discouraged, they're disparaged, they're left out. So why would uh, you know, a young woman who's starting a career want to walk into a snake pit like this when she could be doing very well in other fields? So this is why the proportion of, of women studying computer science dropped from 38% in the 1980s to 17% um, you know, as of two or three years ago. Because this is considered to be a, 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 you know, a man's field, not for women. women. That's, that's the serious problem in the tech industry. And professors, so you've identified a lot of things. You've identified professors not encouraging um, talented young women students or actively discouraging them. The lack of role models. But again, the snake pit aspect of it, you know, the sexual harassment part of it. Like those are three separate things, actually. Lisa, uh, Liza, but it happens. Uh, I called you Lisa again. I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Liza. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it happens systematically through a woman's career. Uh, and that's what the problem is, that uh, women who do make it there have to be really, really, really tough. And most human beings you know, can't go through this. You know, uh, wherever they go, it's the same thing. They're looked at differently. They're, they're expected to dress differently. I mean, why? I mean, why would you put up with this when you have so many other choices? And this is what the problem that the tech industry faces. Then look at the tech industry itself. I mean, um, I had a battle with Twitter's CEO about uh, the fact that there were no women on his board. The excuse in the tech industry always is the pipeline, the pipeline, the pipeline. So when I took on Dick Costolo for uh, uh, not having any women on the board, this happened in the New York Times, his first reaction was to attack me like the boys club does. So instead of calling me an academic fraud, he said Vivek Wadwa is the um, carrot top of academic sources. Yeah, what did he mean by that exactly? Carrot top is a comedian. Who yeah, yeah, no, you see, I, he used yeah, to be a comedian yeah, also. Yeah. Carrot top became very successful, he didn't. He had to drop out and do something different for a living. So he must have resented Carrot Top his whole life. Okay. So this was a chance to get back at both of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, this way he called me a failed comedian. Except yeah. Carrot Top isn't a failed comedian. Yep. Carrot Top um, um, uh, got seventeen million dollars or something ridiculous in the bank. Okay, that's more than Costello had before his company went public. But regardless, it was his way of venting and calling me an academic okay. fraud, because this said this uh, this uh, Silicon Valley mafia, the way I called them. They call me an academic fraud. You know, they've said it on Twitter, they've said it publicly. So Costolo basically echoed the same sentiment that I'm an academic fraud because I've been raising these issues. Except he didn't get away with it. For three or four years ago, they could get away with, the boys club could get away with it. No longer. There was a chorus of, 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 of negative, um, 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 you know, negative articles, social media. They, they were, I mean, um, what was acceptable even four or five years ago in Silicon Valley is no longer. So Silicon Valley can't get away with this behavior anymore. So he had to back off and finally add, add a woman to his board. 
But the point is that this is the excuse that they make consistently is the pipeline. Right. If you look at the Twitter board, you've got two flunkies on it, college dropouts. You've got a psychology major, English major, French literature, anything but computer science. So we keep talking about there not being enough women studying computer science. But when you have Peter Thiel, um, um, PayPal billionaire, offering children $100,000 not to go to college, getting them to drop out of college, how can you know, the boys club argue that women must have a computer science degrees and masters and PhDs and the boys can be dropouts? Where does this pipeline issue ever come in when you don't even need a degree to be in computer science, when you, you don't need a degree to be on the board of Twitter? Be on the board, yeah. Right, so why this dual standard? If a woman or an African, you know, we've been talking about women, right. but it's even worse for African Americans. Right. It's worse for Latinos. If an African American woman dropped out of college or an African American guy dropped out of college, the, uh, the, we, the Silicon Valley would be joking about them selling drugs. Right? Uh, they'd, be, they'd be disparaging them, talking about them, and, and completely write them off. If a white guy drops out of Stanford, he's a hero. He'll get uh, right. six-figure job offers, right. and they'll be bending over backwards to, to fund his, his company. Why this dual standard? If we, we think about it, if a woman dropped out of, uh, of college, would she be, uh, have VCs tripping over each other to give her money? No way. She would be considered a failure. She couldn't cut it. This, they, um, um, uh, that's the attitude we would have about women or Latinos or blacks doing that. So how is Silicon Valley able to preserve this image of being a meritocracy when the exclusion is not just you know, gender, as you point out, but it's uh, exclusion of, of African Americans? Silicon Valley can no longer get away with it, got away with it. For the last, if you read the articles, every week there's now there's one or more articles calling out Silicon Valley for its sexism. I, you know, I, I wrote the first few, but there's a chorus of opinion. I mean, there were people who wrote about it before I did as well. I can't take credit for it, but I was louder than most people were about it. Now there's a chorus of, of opinion, and it's widely accepted even within Silicon Valley. The Silicon Valley has a problem. I mean, this issue about releasing gender data, I started hammering into these tech companies about a year ago about the fact that I want gender data. I spoke to executives. I, I know some of the, the execs of these tech companies are my friends. So I started telling them, look, I want your gender data. I want to know exactly how many women there are in management roles and so on. They wouldn't release it. They considered it to be a trade secret. Google break, broke ranks. And, and, and I appreciate Google for what they did because they also contacted me um, you know, a week before then and gave me all the data. Because they, and, and in fact, I had one of the senior execs from Google call me up and say, Vivek, thank you for being so persistent on it. You gave us a cover we needed to go and make the changes we needed to make internally. And, and, and trust us, we're dead serious about fixing this problem. So they gave me the data, they said it's not good. It was 19% um, were, uh, of their tech workforce was women, which is actually higher than expected to be. I, I thought it would be in the low teens at Google. It was higher than expected and they said we're gonna fix it. They have a, a, a firm wide commitment to fix this. And then you had Facebook and, and Yahoo and all, all, you know, the major tech companies have now started all falling on this sword and saying, okay, here are our numbers. We know we did wrong. We're going to fix it. And there were also, I know, women from within those organizations who were pushing for the release of this data as well. But the trouble is that when, when women speak up, they're called feminists, they're marginalized, they, their careers suffer. And this is why they've learned not to speak up. So, they, so uh, being on the outside, it's easier for me, being an Indian guy with no agenda, <laughs> to be vocal than it is for women. Right, if I no, was a woman, right. I would have been called labeled a feminist and completely marginalized. marginalized exactly. Right, but I was just trying to identify some of the various forces that were being brought to bear. And if I understand correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that Jesse Jackson was also going Jesse around Jackson, shareholders absolutely. meetings, but it, putting pressure at shareholders meetings um, to increase the diversity as there well. So there's pressure, of, there was there's some voices. internal pressure to publish this data. There are people like you from the outside writing about it, and then there are people at shareholders meetings also asking for the release of the data. So uh, all the forces of the universe have come together to shame Silicon Valley. Silicon well, not Valley. all of them, but some of them now. <laughs> I know. Um, but there's enough pressure that Silicon Valley is coming clean, and there's widespread agreement that they need to clean up their act. Even the venture capital firms are embarrassed. Take the top venture capital firm in recent Horowitz, you go to their website, they've got pictures of, of women all over the website now. Now, that doesn't mean that they fix the problem. Uh, if you look at their senior investment partners, all male. If you look at their investments, majority male. They may have funded a, a, few, uh, you know, a handful of, of women CEO, uh, firms with women CEOs, but they won't disclose the, number, the numbers. But the fact is, at least their website has pictures of women on it. 
<laughs> that's a step forward. Right. But it's not like calendar pinup kind of pictures, right? Like the, like well, uh, we talk uh, about the bunnies at the conferences, right? Well, the bunnies. Uh, I'm not going to defend between recent Harvard's over here because um, entrepreneurs who go there talk about the bunnies at the, uh, at the you know, uh, that they meet over there because they have you know, beautiful women that you see there, young, bright women, and so on and so on. You still have that at these venture capital firms. But um, at least they now become conscious about it. And the good firms are seriously looking to add women partners and fix the problem. And so talking about the venture capital again, one of the things, again, trying to sort of break down what the, what the various factors are. Um, you know, the, the percentage of women in computer science might be one of them, although you've sort of exploded that as, as importance. But you also talk about pattern what do you talk about pattern recognition? So the venture capitalists who give money are more likely to give money to say, OK, we gave money to this white male, and it worked out well. So we're just going to look for the same pattern in the people we give money to. Liza, in, in uh, Washington, DC, people will be shocked to hear this. Because here, if you had um, um, uh, a senator or congressman or uh, a business executive saying that we do pattern recognition, you would think that they would go to jail for that. Right, because that's because discrimination. That's it's, another it's, word for discrimination. It's just against the law yeah. to be hiring people or funding people or to be favoring people based on patterns. But they openly talk about it. Um, uh, again, I'm not going to name, uh, I, may, I named, named one of Silicon Valley's m most legendary, iconic venture capitalists, where he talked about the fact that um, when he sees uh, you know, uh, someone that looks like Zuckerberg, when he sees a white male nerd, he, 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 he take, gets confused very easily, <laughs> and he tends to fund them. They openly admit it. They openly admit to ageism, to sexism, to racism. And they have a word for it, pattern recognition. This is show off about their pattern recognition capabilities. They, they, this is a bragging point of, uh, of pride in Silicon Valley even now, that they talk about their ability to recognize a successful entrepreneur when they see one. And they openly admit that that, that successful entrepreneur happens to look like Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, a, a nerdy white male. Now, the, the stereotype has changed in Silicon Valley because people like me went there, started achieving success, and we started helping each other. And we founded our own organizations, and we defied the odds, and we broke into the boys' club. So Indians have now become part of the boys' club, as have some Chinese. So when I say white male nerds, that includes people with, uh, who happen to be from India. We're part of the boys' club. So but they've opened up the male nerds. The male nerds, so it, it. yeah, but, but it's still uh, so you, it can be a middle-aged Indian and still get funding like a, a, a you know a, a Stanford dropout will because there have been enough successful Indians who have, have happened to be older than the white boys are, so we're part of the boys club. <laughs> and but when you know this pattern recognition, I, I wonder how successful it really is because. It Presumably, there have been isn't. some failures also. And so the if you thought, you know, we gave money to this nerdy white guy, and it really didn't work out. So maybe we shouldn't give it to this nerdy white guy. Maybe we should be. The, actually, the New Republic had on their cover a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur who had just had sort of one disastrous failure after another, but could still get money showered Because on. he looked like a white right. nerd. Right. Uh, Kaufman Foundation did an analysis of the venture capital system. And if, uh, if, uh, I'm paraphrasing it, but what they found was that um, you could throw darts <laughs> and, and, and have a better record than the, track, than the uh, venture capitalists have had. In other words, the venture capital community as a whole has underperformed the, uh, you know, the stock indus indices. So this is how effective pattern recognition is, that it doesn't work, that they have failed. At, and system, this entire system is in decline because they've been making the wrong investments. OK, so pattern recognition doesn't, doesn't work, doesn't work that well. It's produced a disaster. We have probably wasted hundreds of billions of dollars because of the stupid pattern recognition, the sexism, this racism that um, uh, we see in Silicon Valley. And this is why I'm fighting this battle, because it's bad for the US economy. It's bad for Silicon Valley. It's bad for the industry. It's bad for women. It's bad for minorities. It's bad, 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 bad. This is why I'm so vocal about it. And so I'm taking the, the arrows in my back, the Indian with the arrows in his back. <laughs> OK, so let's talk for a second about Xerox. Because you know, you've know you talked about Twitter. You've talked about some of the companies that um, are failing, the, the, uh, the, the gender and diversity standard. But Xerox has done pretty well 
And what I wonder is whether the old line established companies that have HR policies, that have sexual harassment policies, the staid old workplaces where measures have been in place for a long time um, are maybe doing a better job than the new start glamorous startups where maybe corners get cut or where just that the policies haven't been in place. So anyway, just talk about Xerox a little bit. Xerox, uh, Sophie Vanderbrook is the chief technology officer. She says that um, uh, her, uh, she, about 40% of her recruits tend to be women now, despite this, you know, all these excuses about the pipeline. So she's able to bring in top women engineers in, uh, into, into her research. She heads up research for uh, Xerox. I mean, so she has done very, very well on diversity. Xerox has a black woman CEO. Who took over from a woman CEO as well. So they had two women yeah. CEOs. So they have really, they have, um, uh, they excel at gender diversity. And they're doing an amazing job. And they've shown that women can, can cut it in the corporate world and that the playing field can be level. IBM is also work, working very hard on this. So uh, uh, it has a woman CEO. I mean, so women, I mean, uh, and, and, and these, these companies may not be growing at, at phenomenal. <laughs> Sorry. It's, oh, it's somebody from Silicon Valley calling. It's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's your wife? Yeah, I'm yeah, not working. You can put her on speakerphone. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, we were talking about IBM and, and with, Xerox. With, and so, basically, uh, IBM and Xerox, they, they may not be growing at phenomenal rates, but the fact that these companies aren't imploding, given the fact that they've had antiquated technologies and so on, shows that um, uh, big companies can actually benefit from this. But if you look at every other data point, Every study that's been done, uh, which looked at um, you know where you have women on board and so on, shows that by having diversity, you win. Yes, yes, that 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 finding that 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 companies that have women on boards do better. Companies or you know diversity on boards. Period. Companies that have diversity is in top management. I'm just not convinced that anybody's really listening to this. Like you could say, yes, pattern pattern recognition's not working out. Yes, companies do better when they have women on boards. But at least in Silicon Valley, it. it you're saying that the message is starting to get through. The message is starting to get through, and they're paying it lip service at least. So I talked about Andreessen Horowitz now having pictures of women on their board. So that means that they realize that there's a, they have a PR problem over here to fix. But I expect that uh, given a little bit more time, there will be a lot of other pressure on them. Because, uh, th for example, the National Venture Capital Association, um, uh, I, I was shocked when they invited me to give a keynote at their big conference a few months ago. I was shocked because you got to realize that I've been a big critic of the venture capital system and I've been equally blunt about it. So I, I thought when I went there, there'd be lynch mobs out to get me. Quite to the contrary, they were clapping, cheering, encouraging, and the, and the uh, management of the NVCA said that Vivek, they agree with me and they're ashamed of uh, the, um, the gender diversity of their firms. And they agree with me that their companies need to start releasing the data now. The next campaign we need to launch, and, and perhaps you should help me with this, is demanding that venture capital firms release gender data about the investments that they make. The reason why we can ask for that is because they're taking public funds. You have state pension funds who are putting money into it. You have, um, um, you know, I mean, all these public sources putting money into it. So they should, therefore, there should be accountability about where the money goes. We should be demanding that they release the gender data because if they did, suddenly you would have these, these sexist VCs who are in their, in their, in their uh, in these meetings, squirming and, and looking at each other, you know, funny, if they started harassing women and, and turning women down just because they didn't think that they fit the patterns. They would be under pressure to clean up their act. So that's the next battle that needs to be fought, is to get the venture capital firms to release gender data. Okay. Right. Okay, that's interesting. So do you think it could be true, as I was sort of trying to suggest, you have, you have Xerox, you have IBM, you have a half of the defense contracting, big defense contractor companies that are led by women. You have General Motors led by women now. And again, these are old line firms that have had HR policies in place for a long time. They know the sexual harassment law. Um, I think more kind of uh, traditional workplaces. And then out in Silicon Valley, you've got companies that were started by roommates, right? You know, networks of friends. The frat boy. Right, right. the frat boy who know each other, right. who are getting venture capital from men who know each other, who are looking for a certain pattern, a certain type, gradually expanding that. And you also have non-traditional workplaces and you have a lot of business being conducted at conferences. And one of the sort of shocking and important essays, I thought, was the one talking about the, uh, 
the things that go on at conferences, the level of sexual harassment that goes on at conferences. And it made me wonder whether this is a, you know, it's a non-traditional industry where a lot of the stuff that happens is happening in kind of non-traditional workplace settings where nobody's policing it and nobody's paying attention. And that's true. And that's exactly how it is. Then. And um, they're getting away with it. They've been getting away with it. And some of the, some of the contributors, it sounds like are calling on the organizers of conferences to try and police the behavior that goes well, on. Well, the TechCrunch, again, leading conference, um, they had two companies in one event. One of them was TitShare, in which uh, they built, did a hackathon in which um, uh, they displayed women's breasts. Another one was, uh, uh, I forget, this is, it gets even more disgusting than that. But these were on stage at a conference. Now, fortunately, uh, Valley Wag, which is the gawker, uh, which is, uh, now has a branch of Silicon Valley, they highlighted and embarrassed these conferences, and they had to apologize. So the conferences have now started issuing statements saying that we're not going to allow uh, sexual uh, uh, stuff happen on our, on our stage. And they're saying we're, we're going to try to include women in, in the panels and, and so on. But you still, it's still a boys' club. It's disgusting. I mean, I wouldn't want to be a woman going to a conference in Silicon Valley, even now. Right. That's just the way it is. And what I thought about when I read that particular essay, um, there was a study that came out a couple of months ago that showed, and this was looking at women scientists, that an extraordinary percentage of women scientists have been sexually assaulted doing their field research when they're out in the field. They're not in the lab, they're not at the university, but they're out you know, somewhere in, in um, you know, in, in some sort of uh, setting that's remote and, and something happens. And there was a, an essay in the New York Times op-ed section last Sunday by a woman to whom this had happened. She was out doing field research and she was sexually assaulted and it really drove her back into the lab and she spent really her career in a lab as opposed to being out doing the kind of scientific research that she wanted. And she was calling and she said, you know, when this happened to me, there was nobody I could even turn to. I mean, there's nobody policing what goes on in the field for scientists. And she was positing that universities or whoever is overseeing the research um, should have should have a system should have should have some sort of policy or program developed to preserve women's safety when they're out doing field research. And again, that made me think of these conferences where nobody's really paying attention. And I know that that when people start setting policies or regulations, that you know the the, the view is then that oh, well, it's not going to be fun anymore because they're calling for these policies and their regulations, and we're not going to be having. But but. I guess, you know, workplace environment is sort of morphing and changing. And so we figured out how to regulate, not completely, but we figured out sort of an approach or many, many organizations and companies have for when something happens in the office. But since a lot of what's going on is not going on in the office, then we have to figure out what to do about that without it being seen as, you know, just raining on the parade. I completely agree with you. That there's a big, big problem over there. Systematic problems. That's why I'm saying that these compasses are not sa it's a one thing to have an event, local event, where, where, where you go to. Um, it's another thing to go to an event off-site where you have all these hotel rooms around and you have these drunken you know, uh, males uh, having an excuse to, uh, to misbehave. It, all I can say is the good news is we're talking about it is being reported on. And this, but this has always been happening. It's only now that, um, that women are speaking up, that men are speaking up, that the media is speaking up. This did not happen before. Uh, recently, as a year or two ago, you didn't read about this stuff. It's not that it just started happening. The reason why we're, 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 we know so much about it is because we're speaking up about it. That's a big step forward. Yeah, yeah. And I have one other question, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, in terms of women's uh, retention in these workplaces, um, I'm an outsider to Silicon Valley, and when I think about the big tech firms, I really think about amenities. Like, you, you hear so much, and in fact, I was in the offices of Twitter in New York not long ago, and they've got beer on tap, they've got, you know, chocolate-covered pretzels, they've got gummy, I mean, they've got all these snacks. They've got this huge snack uh, counter and, and, and alcohol, and so all these great, and you hear and about... When Twitter went public, the celebration was in the strip club across the street. Oh, really? It was yeah. in a strip club? Yeah. Well, they, they, had, they had a celebration there. Oh. So. I, I, I didn't know that. But <laughs> There's I an guess, article in Valley Wag about that. <laughs> um, I think that should have gotten more attention than it did. Uh, so there were no, there, so, so there weren't any um, 
strippers in the in the workplace that I was in, but there were a lot of amenities. And when you and when you think about the campuses out on the West Coast, you think about you know the cafeterias and the ping pong tables and the childcare and all the great stuff. So it seems like it would be a pretty cushy environment to work in, and so maybe good for like working mothers, working parents, because you've got all these amenities. No, because but you don't have the daycare centers. You don't right. have you don't, you don't have, the, have the daycare. So you've got the ping pong table, but not the daycare. Yeah, but why don't they have the nurseries over there? Right. So ha actually, so how is it in fact um, a, a more competitive, cutthroat, long hours? Family unfriendly environment than someone like me might might think because we're focusing on the amenities. I'm focusing. On it's a family amenities. unfriendly environment, okay. and this is why they prefer the young males who don't have families, and this is why the VCs uh, give them the money and give women a hard time. Never mind that uh, it's it's causing a decimation of the entire system because the formula doesn't work. You, if you had more women led startups. You'd have lower, lower failure rates. You'd have higher economic returns. You'd have better products. The economy would benefit if, if we, if only if we would uh, open up our eyes. Well, so let me open it up to questions then. People, uh, yeah, from the back. I actually just wanted to follow up directly on that last point about sort of caregiver bias that happens um, in the workplace and the tech industry. I mean, how, how do we make these women employees seem like, or make it clear that they are equally valuable to the workplace despite their caregiver responsibilities? Is it, is it putting in place policies like paid family leave or childcare? Um, and I can't help but think that all of these, high, the, the few highly credentialed women that are in the field if they leave because of a lack of support systems, this is a domestic brain drain. We are losing talent that we have invested in, um, and there are already so few of them, only 17%, as you say. So I just wonder how can we Before we that? make them feel that way, we have to believe that way, which means that executive management has to have that value system, and they don't right now. The fact is that if you look at the board, and this is why I've been attacking the boards. My, you know, I, I deliberately picked a fight with the CEO of Twitter. It wasn't accidental. I, I knew what I was doing, and I knew it would create major controversy when I did that interview with the New York Times, because it starts with the boards. Um, if you're going to have an all-male board, the likelihood is you're going to have an all-male executive team. If you have an all-male executive team, it's likely that you're going to have an all-male senior management team. If you have an all-male senior management team, it's likely you're going to have an all-male company. So until we now get 50-50 boards and have women, on the boards asking why this chief technology officer isn't a woman, or why we aren't considering women candidates, and have a sensitivity to the needs of women up there. Until you have the board asking why don't, you know, before you uh, have this, you throw this big party, or before you invest more in um, these perks, why don't you have a daycare center for women and publicize it? Why don't we now look at our hiring practices and so on? If you don't have women at the top, you're not going to have women at the bottom. And this is why we have to start by holding them accountable at the board level. And then uh, we have to have a real belief there, real policies there to encourage women. So what's, what's hard to make sense of for me is you were talking about caregiver bias, which is not hiring someone because you're worried about that they're going to become a parent or they're not going to be committed or somehow um, exhibiting bias against a, a parent, specifically a working mother uh, in the workplace. And yet a lot of these big tech companies have have pretty good paid parental leave, maternity leave and paternity leave. So the policies at least for paid no, leave are on the books. They actually don't, not in, in most tech companies. Not in most. No. So the big ones have, have made. Yeah, some of them have some policies, but by and large they don't. This is a foreign concept of the tech industry. OK. Yeah. Um, I have, a, I have a different question, but it, it's a very discouraging that we're having this same discussion uh, 30 years after I, I discussed these <laughs> issues about leave and getting leave for, for women for, for uh, care for, you know, for various benefits. But um, anyway, my, my question is, uh, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, coding camps for girls and uh, efforts to for STEM education and and I'm wondering if uh, 
if we will see some change, because there is an emphasis now to get girls in these fields, do you think that that's encouraging? Yes, it's very encouraging. In fact, Google has been uh, leading the charge on some of these girl, girls' camps, and the tech industry has now realized it has to, to do something about the problem itself. Overall, everything is moving in the right direction. But the most important, uh, there are two other things which are very relevant here, uh, which are happening, which are going to make the difference. Number one, women are now helping each other. The mentoring didn't happen as recently as 10 or 15 years ago. If you speak to, because I've interviewed hundreds of women, speak to the older, older women, they talk about other women not helping them. If you talk to the younger women, they talk about women being very helpful. That's a generational shift that's happened. And it, you can, it's so clear, you can, you, know, you, you, you can see that shift between the old and the new. So now you have, for example, um, a day after tomorrow, there's a big event in Silicon Valley called Women 2.0. There'll be a thousand women there. And women helping each other, rah, 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 we can succeed. It's an amazing, uh, amazing, wonderful conference. I'm going out of my way to be there because it's, uh, to me, it's the most important event in Silicon Valley, uh, women for women. The other thing is that the cost of technology has dropped exponen exponentially. It's a long discussion, but um, before you, uh, venture capital was, was mandatory for starting a software technology business because you needed to buy servers, you needed to buy ha expensive hardware. Minimum cost of starting a business would be about $3 million or so. Today, all you need is a laptop and food, and you can start a company. Also, to create technologies outside the tech industry, health-based technologies, sensor-based technologies, to be able to do you know, 3D printing, to be able to create new energy technologies, the cost of doing all of these things has dropped exponentially. So venture capital, which has been holding women back, has become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now VCs worry about be being left out of the system. They suck up to the young entrepreneurs because they're worried that they, they'll miss out on some idea, on some big new thing. So women basically are now primed to lead the new era of innovation. In fact, uh, if you look at every, this is something I discussed in, uh, in uh, a couple of chapters in the book. If you look at every data point, the, the future belongs to women because uh, uh, they're, they're, they're getting better educated, they're having greater success, they're mentoring each other, the technology is moving in that direction. Everything, every data point you look at says that uh, within a decade from now, we will not be having these discussions. It may have been that 30 years ago we had these discussions and nothing's changed. In the tech industry, it will change because it has to change. Everything is in favor of women. We will probably be debating how do we be more inclusive towards men, <laughs> which is 20 years from now, that's a debate I want to be having. Right. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just in Silicon Valley last four days and working with um, the Global Innovation Summit uh, and the folks that organized that. And they had a small dinner last Thursday night and um, half the group was women. And so I was Where really- was that? That was Silicon Valley? Yeah, last Thursday night. It happened? Um, it was a small <laughs> group of 14 people, but at any rate, about half of them were women. And one of the things that, um, so he's, you probably know Victor Huang, he's trying to take the global innovation ecosystem of Silicon Valley global. Um, and I think he's doing, I don't know, a fairly good job of trying to be, look at women's Victor's issues. Victor's a good guy. Okay. Um, but I wanted to ask you about two or three things. One is um, the sort of increasing focus on collaboration and uh, in the last number of years, but particularly in the last year or two. Um, and the, you know, the women tend to be greater collaborators in my mind than men. So there's that question. The second is the younger generation of men. I always feel working on gen gender issues here in Washington that um, my hope is that the younger generation of men that I work with are much more sensitized than the older generation. So I wanted you to talk about the generation issues. And then those younger men that are fathers are a whole subset among themselves. They want to be home with their kids. Um, it's a different generation. Too many Let me answer the questions before yeah. I forget them. Number one, about collaboration. Um, I've researched why Silicon Valley works. This is another uh, line of research I've done and written extensively about. Is it why is, there only one, why is there only one Silicon Valley? Why is it that regions have spent billions of dollars and have nothing to show for it? The answer is because Silicon Valley is one giant network. Silicon Valley learned that by cooperating, collaborating, by exchanging ideas, by, uh, by encouraging failure, by, uh, by you know, glamorizing failure, and just generally by idea sharing, you could, you could win. And that's why the system, system in Silicon Valley works as well as it does. Second part of it, women. Women have not been helping each other. It, it used to be that if you look at the older generation of women, they would uh, defy the odds and achieve success by being like the guys. 
they would be the tomboys, they would be dressed up like the men, they would be behaving like the men, and when they achieved success, they didn't want to identify with women because they were afraid of being labeled feminists. So the attitude became that, look, if we can make it, so can you. I mean, so women did not help women. This has changed dramatically over the last five or seven years. The last two or three years, night and day for, over what it was. So all of that is, is goodness. As far as the young boys go, there are, two, there are two types of young boys. One is the spoiled, disgusting brats who you read about. I mean, uh, and the sad thing is that a lot of these, I mean, these really super successful companies are done by these sexist, you know, jerky brats. I mean, I, um, uh, the, the, the dropouts especially because when you drop out of college, you don't learn the social skills. You don't need to learn the, you know, you don't deal with rejection failure. You don't learn to have to collaborate with people, to work with people. So, you know, Thiel and company may talk about drop, kids dropping out of school and starting companies when they're 17, but you never develop the social skills that you do. Because the social skills we develop about collaboration come from working in teams. Uh, even being rejected, even having uh, women you know, turn you down when you come on to them, you develop sensitivity to that. You, you learn you know, what does work, what doesn't work. You learn how to behave. If you don't go to college, you don't learn those things. You basically you know, go to high school, and then you're now sitting in this lab writing code all day. You don't have the social skills you should have. The problem is that many of these, um, uh, the moguls over there are this generation. So the, um, now the good news is that they're the outlier. You also have an entire crop of, you know, of children coming out who are very sensible, you know, who are connected to each other, who are global and so on and so on. So it's good and bad. The problem is that a lot of the people we put on a pedestal are these spoiled brats. The third question I forgot. <laughs> well, fathers who have daughters tend to be very supportive. This is why I have so many friends. Because uh, a lot of the males who are supporting me have daughters, and they realize that they don't want their daughters to be left out. That their generation may have been different, but they, don't, they want the next generation to be different. So um, th this is why I would say 80% of, of men have been supporting me. 10% of them have been you know, negative, negative, negative. 10% are in between. They'll say dumb things every now and then, but they really don't mean it. <laughs> That's a rough estimate. No scientific basis to that. Um, thank you so much for you know uh, raising awareness around this issue and for writing this book. And as you said, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a woman in technology. I've been in the field for 14 years. I'm just glad that this conversation is happening. I feel like this is the right time. Finally, it's actually happening. So thank you so much for for making this happen. Um, I just want to share a you know a personal uh, story, and then I want to move on to two questions that I have. Um, you did a good job of, uh, you know, uh, talking about the uh, entire workflow of, a, of, you know, getting a woman to in interested in STEM subjects, getting a girl interested in STEM subjects, the challenges she experiences there, and then moving forward, you know, when she's in college, the experiences she has there, and then finally in the workforce, which is where we've focused most of our conversation today. But just on a personal note, I just, you know, it was very heartbreaking for me to experience what my sister just went through the, over this past summer. She has, um, I have a niece, seven-year-old niece. My sister wanted to put her in coding school to go back to the, uh, the other, uh, you know, ladies' comment in coding school. And my seven-year-old niece just looked back at my sister and said, but none of my friends are there, you know. So I think it's important yeah. um, to get girls to be encouraged in technology and engineering to also create that ecosystem where, hey, your friends are coding with you and make it, uh, you can cr design products that are of concern to you. Um, and I know there are a lot of coding schools around the country that are mushrooming um, and focusing on this issue. Um, I would like to thank the four men who are in this room uh, for attending this event. And my question is, how do you get the men to attend these events? So that's my first question. Um, because the answer is, I don't know the answer. I've, I've tried. <laughs> okay. you, you it's, al it's, always like, answer. it's always like this. Um, I mean, normally there'll just be one or two men who just happen to be d dragged there because they have to pick up their wives or something. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's not why you guys are here. <laughs> I just <laughs> hope. Um, because I'm just coming back from Atlanta. I was at the GSMA Connected Women event. Same thing. Full of talented young women in the technology sector. Two men who uh, were at the event, so it was very brave of them, I feel, to attend. Um, I hope that changes. I really hope that we can start to see a lot more men in these events. Um, my question, the other question is, I know there is a movement going on in the US to change this mindset. Are you seeing 
um, a similar movement around the world? Are you seeing trends change around the world as well? Um, and if so, you know, if you could share those examples, that would be great. Around okay. the world, it's mixed. I mean, Europe is uh, very active in, um, in trying to level the playing field and have more women on board and so on and so on. India, there's, uh, uh, the IT industry has been shamed into it. So if you look at the IT industry, they have the lower echelons. They have um, uh, much, I mean, about a third are women now, except the executive ranks, almost no women. Um, in the Middle East, increasingly, women are finding that uh, they can get into technology, and it's an outlet for them because they don't have to go to work physically. They can work from home. They can form their own communities. So that's why you're seeing a lot of women entrepreneurship in the Middle East, surprisingly. The numbers in some parts of the Middle East are, are better than Silicon Valley because it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a safe way for women to be working and to be part of the workforce and to be contributing. So it's mixed all over the world. Because but they're able to do it from their homes yeah, and not have to exactly. do it. So it's mixed all over the world. There's a group of Afghan women particularly that, that I'm most impressed with, uh, which um, um, uh, Citadel Software, whatever it's called, I forgot the name of it, but they're doing some amazing things to bring Afghani women into the, into the fold. So it's mixed all over the world, but overall it's happening. And this is why it's important for Silicon Valley to lead the charge, because it's a trendsetter. Until we fix Silicon Valley, we won't fix the rest of the world. Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one I hope is, is pretty easy. Um, I read that France is uh, requiring programming to be in the high school curriculum. And I wonder if, if you think that is, is a, a good way to at least expose uh, girls to, to STEM and, and hopefully create sort of that community. Everyone has a little bit of background in programming. I think uh, coding has become a basic skill, just like reading and writing. Yeah. You have to understand technology now. So it's a, it's a great idea to start introducing it early. Uh, so my second question, which I I hope is easy, but I, I fear is not. Uh, I work at the Open Technology Institute here at the New America Foundation, and on the technology team uh, where I work, uh, there are there are no women, and we have open jobs, and we'll get maybe a hundred applicants, and of them, maybe two will be uh, women, and. I wonder, what is, the, is there something in the way that we're doing our job descriptions, something in the way we're portraying our culture? Because, because, I, you're, I can because you're leaving it open, you need to go out and, and recruit in women's colleges. Go there and set up, to set up a booth there and have your people go there and meet these women, tell them about why it's such a wonderful place to work, and then uh, uh, you know, come up with some women-friendly policies and advertise those. So you'll find that um, uh, if you do that, you'll, you'll attract women there. Because right now, they don't know. I mean, we, how, how is a woman supposed to know this is a women-friendly place that you're looking for women? They look at the ads every, like everywhere else. And, and they've, first of all, there are relatively few women in the field. Secondly, they, uh, they, the, the word of mouth, from word of mouth, they know that it's good to go to companies like Xerox because they're women-friendly and where they have friends who have gone. So until you have, because uh, uh, a lot of it is through word of mouth. So you'll have to just create that word of mouth yourself. Thank you. Two more questions. Hi, a confession. I bristled when you mentioned that people were mindlessly attacking you. Uh, how do you react to criticism, for, especially from women, for whom nothing about us without us is a core tenet of their activism? So how do you respond to allegations of tone policing? And when you're invited to give a keynote, are you willing to recommend a woman instead, saying, if you're going to talk about this issue, maybe I shouldn't be the person on the stage. Right. Here's a woman who can talk about her own experiences in her own words. You know, uh, I, I've, uh, I've, been at, uh, uh, um, I've taken quite a bit of fire from some feminists who basically are resentful of the fact that I'm getting all this publicity and the fact that my name is listed first on the book. Now, as far as the book goes, I had no choice. I told the publishers I wanted to, 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 to this to be uh, you know, a book for women, by women. I didn't even ha want to have my name on it. But they wouldn't publish it without my name because I had enough of a name that I could get the attention. And the reason why I'm getting all the media coverage is because I'm a guy talking about it. If I was a woman talking about it, that media coverage wouldn't happen. So yes, I can. And, and, and when I do the interviews, I always mention for I always to you know, encourage them to interview some of the, um, uh, the women who have contributed to the book. And I work very hard on trying to include them. But the choice is either I don't speak and we get no coverage, or I speak and I take the fire. So I've decided that um, because the vast majority of women do appreciate the fact that the guy is speaking up for them, the f a few of them who feel jealous or resentful of it, 
I can't help it. There will always be people who are unhappy, but I have to do it. I have to speak from my heart. I have to do what I can. This is the cause I believe in. This is why I'm speaking up about it. The fact that um, uh, you know, 50% uh, of the, uh, the discussion here is, 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 is women. It could have been two women on, on stage over here, but it wouldn't have been the same discussion. So it is what it is. I, it, you know, um, I've tried, done my best to put women forward as much as I can, but I'm going to speak up whether it, some people are unhappy with it or not. So this, you know, if you look on Amazon, for example, I, I happened to be looking yesterday. There are 15 reviews. 14 of them are extremely positive. One of them is this, uh, um, uh, this you know, you know, feminist who was very unhappy that I'm getting all the attention for this. She basically slammed me on it. Because what happened was that she went on Twitter and started posting a whole series of negative comments. I decided to ignore her. But uh, on the social media account, someone retweeted her tweets without comment, and she took it as harassment by me. So she's basically going around saying Vivek was harassing her. I didn't harass her. I didn't even know who she was. I had nothing to do with it. So then she posted a Google thing. She posted negative reviews there. So I went on her Google page and I commented on it and explained, look, I, I'm deeply apologetic. I take responsibility for whatever. If someone you know, affiliated with the Innovating Women has retweeted her tweet, first of all, I'm not convinced that that's a negative because I've encouraged, uh, even on my Twitter account, I retweet negative tweets. People who are attacking me, I retweet it because I, don't, because I also retweet people who are saying good things about me. I want to maintain a balance of good and bad so that People who are following me know that th there's criticism and there's praise. So it's the same thing over here. So first of all, I don't think it's a bad thing. Secondly, I, I said I humbly apologize and I, d you know, and, I, and I sincerely didn't want to offend her. So I apologized on her page. I don't know what else I can do. There's a demand about me not doing media interviews or me not being on panels. I'm sorry, I can't do that because that'll take away from the cause I believe in. I'm allowed to speak about, about uh, my view is that you, when you see injustice, you have to speak about it no matter where it happens. And if you don't speak up, you are complicit in it. So I am going to speak about any injustice, whether or not people feel offended. Because I also had an African-American uh, comment that, hey, he's also talking on behalf of African-Americans. How dare he? Well, I'm sorry. I see an injustice there. And I'm going to speak up about it, whether they like it or not. That's my attitude. Well, that seems like a good note to conclude on. Thank you all so much who braved all the various traffic delays to get here this morning. This was a great discussion. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, Vivek will be signing copies of the book out, um, outside. And uh, um, so I hope you'll get one. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. <laughs>